Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dearman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation 21, and here's what John says. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth uh, had passed away, had passed away. Okay, now, remember that there was an explanation of the thousand-year reign of Jesus in chapter 20, and now after the thousand-year reign of Jesus, there's a new heaven and a new earth. And of course, it said in the previous chapter that the old heaven and the old earth was done away with. Well, think about this, by the way. And there is controversy about the age of man, the age of human beings. But it seems to me and many scholars that between the creation, or maybe we could say the fall, but let's just say, uh, let's just say the creation of human life, Adam and Eve, and Abraham was about 2,000 years. And then between Abraham and Jesus coming was about 2,000 years. And between Jesus coming and the day in which we live is about 2,000 years. So you've got 6,000 years. And then you have here that we just read about the millennial reign of Christ. This is 1,000 years. Well, what does that make? That makes 7,000 years and seven being the number of completion. And then John 21 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So some people would, would say and argue that this is not really a new heaven and a new earth, but it's a, a regenerated or a revitalized, uh, sort of a renovated uh, heaven and earth that we had before. Well, okay, you know, you can say that if you want to, but this says, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and it said also there was no more sea. So we, we'd call that maybe an ocean. Well, you know, all the oceans around the world, the majority of the earth that we know is covered in water. But this said, in the new earth, there was no more sea. And by the way, when it says a new heaven, it's not talking about a new heaven where God lives. That heaven did not need to be renewed or done away with. That heaven was perfect. In fact, Jesus said, we should pray here on earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, everything was okay. It was here on the earth. But remember, there are different heavens. One heaven, the lowest heaven, is this atmosphere around the earth. We could say where the birds fly and we watch them fly, where the planes fly. This is all that heaven. There's also a heaven that's the spirit realm, where the demonic is and the angelic beings are. That's also called heaven, spirits that, that rule in heaven and, and you know, uh, move around in that realm of heaven. But then there's the heaven where God lives, okay? Well, this is talking about the new earth that we live on, this planet, and the heaven, the atmosphere around it, where birds fly, or we could even say the stars and such. And so... John said there's a brand new one, and on this new earth, there's no more sea. There's, it doesn't have this massive body of water. Verse 2, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so uh, the symbolism here is very interesting that you've got a city, and this is New Jerusalem. So there's an old Jerusalem that the book of Revelation uh, portrayed as, uh, as Sodom, as spiritual Sodom. In other words, that Jerusalem had been compromised. But this is a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Interesting that we are the bride of Christ, and now it's describing this new Jerusalem as 
being adorned as a bride, adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his God, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Now, God has been saying this, that he wants this, way back since the book of Exodus, when he brought his people out of the promised land. He brought them into the wilderness with the, excuse me, he brought them out of Egypt into the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And God in the wilderness began to say to them, I want to be your God. I want you to be my people, my special treasure. I want to dwell with you and such. And he even told them to make a tent out in the hot Middle Eastern wilderness, the desert, so that he could dwell right in the midst of them. Why would you want to come from heaven? And I believe specifically this was the Lord Jesus Christ that did this, and I won't go into why I believe that. But I believe that this was certainly God, but I believe it was Jesus that wanted to live in the middle of his people, right in the middle of the camp, in a tent in the hot Middle East desert, because he just loves us and he wants to be with us. There had to be some kind of a separation, a veil, and so on, because there was sin among them. But he wanted to be close. Well, now there's no more sin. Now that's all been dealt with. There's a new heaven. There's a new earth. And it, and it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. Oh, I want to be glad to have no more death. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Glory to God. This is going to be wonderful. Verse 5, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Everything. I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, in other words, John, write this down. Write, for these words are true and faithful. This is really going to happen, in other words. Verse 6, And he said to me, It is done. Now, here's another it's done. He said it's done at the rapture. He said it's done at the end of the tribulation period, the final judgment. And now here again at the end of the millennium, going into the new era after the 7,000 years uh, of the age of mankind on the earth. Or we could say after the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, we're going into a whole new era. And he said that old era is completely done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Verse 7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. Notice this is something that uh, Jesus was saying to the seven churches. He who overcomes, I will grant this and that and the other. So notice that just because you made Jesus Lord and got born again, that doesn't mean you can just stop and relax and let sin dominate your life. No, you need to continue to serve the Lord. He's given you the strength. He's given you the forgiveness. He's given you the Holy Spirit. He's given you the word of God. And so we need to use what he's given us to walk with him, to walk with him, not to earn salvation, but to appreciate and accept salvation that we walk with him in newness of life. So he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. And watch this. And he shall be my son. Now, isn't this interesting? He says, he who overcomes. Well, this is not really talking about just one individual, but it's talking about all of us. But it says, and he shall be my son. Well, you think, well, wait a minute. Doesn't Jesus, uh, doesn't God only have one son, the Lord Jesus Christ? But remember this, we become one with Jesus. And he is the head and we are the body, the fullness of him. And now together with him, this is a mystery, but together with him, we make up God's son because we become one with Jesus. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Oh, thank God. Jesus has purchased this for us. Verse eight, but the cowardly, Okay, now he's still talking about what it's going to be like in this new age. But the cowardly, just to contrast what it's going to be like for us who overcome by the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony and such. He said, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable people who do detestable things, murderers, sexually immoral, your people who willingly go across the line. Uh, sorcerers, 
idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, which we already talked about. Verse 9, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the last, the seven last plagues came to me. And notice the seven last plagues, the bowls, the seven last plagues. That clearly indicates that the, the seven bowls are distinct from the seven trumpets, which I'd already mentioned that some people believe that those were synonymous events. But this says the seven bulls, which were the seven last plagues. Didn't mention anything about the trumpets being the seven last. So it says, full of the seven last plagues, which we're not going to get into now because that's already done. But this just happens to be one of those seven angels. See? So then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was uh, like a most precious stone, Listen to this. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. This right here, among many other scriptural proofs, tells us that replacement theology, in other words, the theology that, well, since Israel reject, rejected Jesus the Messiah and uh, the Gentiles accepted him, then that means that God has done away with Israel. He's done away with that old covenant. And now it's just the church. And yeah, some Jews can get saved and be a part of the church. But now he's not dealing with the Jews anymore uh, or dealing with that covenant anymore because now the church and the covenant, the new covenant with the church has replaced that covenant. Well, that's not true. That's not scriptural. No, the new covenant actually is a fulfillment of the old covenant to Israel, and God is still committed to his covenant with Israel. And here you see at the end of the age, after the millennium, when there's a new heaven, a new earth, there's a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. What does it say? It says that the 12, uh, the names written on them, on these 12 gates, the names written on them are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> you think God forgot about his people? Uh-uh. In fact, the very idea that God is still committed to keep his covenant with Israel is what gives us, the church, Gentile believers, so much confidence that God will also keep his promises with us. If he'll keep them with Israel, he'll keep them with us. If he didn't keep his promises with Israel, then how can we have confidence that he'll keep his promises to us? Verse 13, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. So notice there are 12 gates in all. Verse 14, now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So first we have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's the old covenant. But now we have the names of the 12 apostles of the, of the Lamb. Now, of course, the 12 apostles of the Lamb were also Jewish people. But they're representing now those, the church, the born-again people who came after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so verse 15, And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. So the city is a square. And watch this. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Now, this is about 1,380 miles. Let's just say roughly 1,400 miles. 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles long. But listen to this, 1,400 miles high. Now, this is very interesting. Some people take this to be symbolic, but 
because it's 12 and it's multiples of 12 and so on. But nonetheless, you know, it could be literal. And uh, nobody's seen a city quite like this before that's more like a cube. Others have speculated that it's, it's likely the shape of a pyramid. Well, it could be, but it seems to me like it, it seems like a cube. Look at verse 17. Then he measured its wall 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's not enough wall to go all around the city. Plus, it's a cube in its size. No, this is talking about the thickness of a wall. About 216 feet thick are the walls around this city. It goes on to say, verse 18, the construction of its wall was jasper. Oh, this is not cinder block. This, these are not bricks. Notice the construction of its wall uh, was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. I mean, this is purified gold, but it is literal gold. And it says in verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And it says in verse 21, the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. So it wasn't, they weren't gates made of pearls. <laughs> Each gate was one pearl. How'd you like to see that oyster? I mean, these are massive pearls. Uh, and the gate would be hewn out of that pearl, sculptured, if you will. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Isn't that going to be wonderful to see that? Verse 22, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So we're going to dwell in the Lord and worship in the Lord and in the Lamb, in that temple. Verse 23, of course, it's hard for us to get our minds around these, but when John's seeing it, it makes sense to him. But <laughs> some of these things, I have to see it to, for it to really make sense unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. I believe it nonetheless. Verse 23, it says, The city had no need of the sun, or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. This is Jesus, the Lamb. The Lamb is its light. Verse 24, and the nations of those who are saved. Interesting that now, here after the millennial reign of Christ, and we got a new heaven, a new earth, and he still talks about the nations of those who are saved. What does that mean? God loves our cultures. God loves our ethnicities. And here, he's not ashamed of any of them. He loves the variety. He created us. See, and so, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, in the light of Jesus. And the kings of the earth bring their glory. So notice, there are still kings of the earth in this new earth. There are still rulers around this earth, and it's around the new earth. And it says, the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it, into this new Jerusalem, into the place where God is. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night. So it doesn't say the gates will not be shut day or night because there is no night. It is just light all the time with the light of the Lord. And the gates are never shut, and the kings of the earth are still living, still existing. I'm not talking about the same kings, but I'm saying we still have kings. We still have rulers in various parts of the earth, that new earth. And they're living their lives, and people are living their lives, and they're bringing glory to the Lord Jesus and to God as they always should have. Verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So there will be glory in the nations. There will be honor in the nations. There will be prosperity in the nations. And they'll bring of that prosperity to honor the Lord God. Verse 27, but there shall... By no means enter it 
anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So that's all that is going to be in this new age. And uh, so this temple, nobody comes into the temple, nobody's entering the new Jerusalem unless they were written in the Lamb's book of life. At that time, there will be no unbelievers. Everybody will be in their regenerate state, uh, as far as we can tell, and we'll all be living, uh, I mean, just ecstasy. I mean, just the glory of God, perfection in the Lord. Only God could pull this off, but he's going to do it. Okay, there it is, chapter 21, one chapter to go, and this is the, the climax, the finale, and Jesus is going to leave us with a final word in chapter 22. Thank you again for watching today. If you haven't already done it, click the like button and share this video with others to help them get into God's word. Also, we'd love to partner with you to advance the kingdom of God. To find out more about our BFAM strategy, our ministry school, the BFAM Training Center, other great teaching resources, or to launch a house church, visit solidlives.com. Thank you again, and I'll see you tomorrow.